Welcome and congratulations to beginning the journey to learn Web2Py and Python. In this first part of the course, we will build a project where we're going to have this simple context application you see in front of you. We are going to get you set up on a platform which is called Python Anywhere, and you will get your own little subdomain there. Um, then we're going to walk through things like what, what's HTML, what, how do we think about databases, and we're just going to cover a lot of cool stuff. There's just one thing I really want you to do. You really have to write all the code I write. If you don't, this is going to be the most wasteful time in your whole life. You can't learn programming without actually doing it yourself because programming is really a contact sport. You have to meet all these issues, these troubles, and I'm going to help you. Uh, and we're even going to look at it. another student who actually got into trouble doing this course. So we're going to help that student during the course so you can see how we can solve and think about issues that arise when we do programming. So I'm really looking forward to getting started. So I see you in the next lesson and have fun. Okay, so this video is only for you if you haven't installed Google Chrome on your computer yet. If you have Google Chrome on your computer, just skip to the next video. Otherwise, open your web browser, Firefox, Internet Explorer, or Safari, depending on what computer you have. Write chrome.google.com. Open up the Chrome website. Uh, hold your mouse over download. Click for personal computers. And that would give you a download button uh, which will give you the correct version of Google Chrome for your operating system. Just click download Chrome, accept and install. And uh, depending on your computer, you will get the download notification. And when that download has finished, you just click that icon, in follow the instructions that will come up on your screen, install Google Chrome, and then I'll see you in the next video. We're going to need a place where we can host our website. And the platform I've chosen for this course is called Python Anywhere. And I have selected this because I think it's a great place and an easy place to get started. So open pythonanywhere.com, then click Start Running Python Online in less than a minute. And here you can select what type of account you want to use. And uh, for this course, it's OK just to create the beginner account. And that will give you a URL to your web app that is going to be your username.pythonanywhere.com. Uh, later, you can upgrade this account, for example, to a web developer account, which would give you, which would allow you to connect the custom domain, for example, your your domain name.com or something like that. Uh, click create beginner, create a beginner's account. Uh, fill in your username; it has to be unique. Your email. Your password, repeat your password, agree to the terms and conditions, register, and I'll see you in the next video. Um, depending on how you got here now, uh, I have just created a new beginner's account. And uh, if you didn't get here, just click the dashboard up here and you will get to the same web page I am right now. And what we want to do is that we want to create a new web app. Uh, I created a, a web app with the username Secret Web. So my URL now is secretweb.pythonanywhere.com. Click the web, and you see that I have no web apps. Then we're going to click Add New Web App. We're going to see that we have a new app domain name here, secretweb.pythonanywhere.com. Um, click Next. Uh, we want to install Web2Py because that's the framework we're going to use. And I'm going to explain that later, what it is. Uh, write a password. Try to keep it secret because uh, you don't want people messing around in your code. They might get into sensitive data that you have. So I'm going to write in my password. And then we click Next. And that's going to take some time. So now we're back again and we see that it's all done. Your web app is now set up. 
And um, let's take a look at what happened here. If we right click Secret Web and we open link in a new tab, uh, we can see that we have a brand new install of the Web2Py framework. Uh, it gives you a bare bone minimal web page and um, you can also see that our web page has been installed at slash home slash secret web slash web to pi. We're also using the Python version 2.7. Uh, web to pi doesn't exist for Python 3 yet. And um, yeah, that's it. Now we're set up and good to go to start working with web to pi. See you in the next video. Okay, if you have been following along until now, you should have Web2Py installed on Python Anywhere. And to get your own app, you should write your username on Python Anywhere. So secretweb.pythonanywhere.com is it's for me. You will change it to your username.pythonanywhere.com. You click enter. And we can see that it automatically adds slash welcome slash default slash index. And we're going to get into what that is soon. Uh, for now, we're going to click the administrative interface button and we're going to see that something has happened here. Number one is that we see a green icon here, a lock, which means that we are on an encrypted connection to Python Anywhere. And that is important because we're going to write in passwords and when we send passwords over the internet, we should definitely be encrypting our connection. So I write the password here. I set, I set up when I, or that I wrote when I install Web2Py. And if you use the same password for Web2Py as when you register for Python Anywhere, go to Python Anywhere and change that password because you don't want the same password for Python Anywhere and the same one for Web2Py. It's just not good practice. Anyways, let's move on. Log in. And what can we see? Well, we're going to save the password there so we don't have to write it in every single time. Uh, you might think that you should go and upgrade now to the latest version. Don't do that. Uh, what happened to me was that I did that and everything just broke and uh, I just don't have the time to sit and figure out why. But yeah, in, in releases soon, mostly that will be fixed also, I'm guessing. Um, and what do we see here on the left? Well, we see that we have three installed applications in Web2Py. We have something called the admin, which is actually the interface that we're looking at right now. We have examples. If we want to see how we can do things in Web2Py, we can go in there and look at their code. And then we have something called the web welcome app. And that's the first thing I want to take a look at. So on a Mac, I will go control click and click open link on a new tab. On a PC, you just right click. And there we have another tab in Google Chrome. We can see, okay, this is the same app that we got when we actually just wrote this. So by default, you can see that Web2Py will open up the welcome app uh, and show you that design. So let's move on now and create a new application. And the application we're gonna create here is a contacts app. So we write contacts. We click create and we see that a new application contacts has been created. Awesome, isn't it? Uh, let's click on site to get back where we were. And what has happened here? Well, now we can see that there is one more application here and that is the contacts application we created. Let's take a look how that app looks for people. So again, control click on a Mac or right click on a PC click open link in your window, or in your tab, sorry. And here, and we can see that this is, this looks very familiar to us. This looks actually exactly like this, except that it's this one says welcome, and that one says contacts. And why is that? Well, it turns out that when Web2Py, uh, when you create a new simple application with Web2Py, what it does is it, it just clones the welcome app and changes things like the title and other small things for you. So every time you create a new application, it will be a clone of the welcome app. So don't mess with the welcome app. Just keep it as it is and uh, we'll, we'll clone those and work on clones of that welcome app. Open up 
this contacts app and you don't do it by clicking here that would actually open the the app for as the, in the user perspective what we're going to do is that we're going to click manage and then we're going to click edit so let's do that and here we can see all the code that is in our project and we'll get into what all these things are but so what is the first thing you do do you go into coding or do you do something else well, wouldn't it be really cool if we can have like a time machine that if we screw code up, we can jump back to any point in time? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to click at, in this little thing here called versioning. And then we're going to say, we're going to give it a title. We say start of project. We click that button commit. And what, what has happened here? Well, what we've done is that we've created a repository here. Uh, and what is that? Well, it's, it's version controlling. And version controlling is really important because, like I said, it gives you like a time machine that allows you to jump backwards to a specific point in time. So if you screw up your code, you can jump back in time, in this case, to start a, start a project and always kind of you know you write a little bit cold you do another commit so you kind of save that version on top of the old one and then you can move backwards in time if you need to cool so let's click edit here okay so the first thing i want to do here is that I want to create a very simple contacts application which would allow a person to go to a web page and see the contact deals, details of a person. So how do we do this in the most simple way possible? Well, uh, we're in the application contacts, otherwise go to sites and let's do that. See the contacts app, manage, edit. So now we're back in our application. And uh, we go down, not to models, not to controllers, but to something called views. And these are so-called standard HTML files. Uh, well, they're a little bit modified at some places. Um, and we're going to find this default slash index.html. And uh, we're going to start changing that one. So we can change how this contacts app looks like for the user. So we have opened up the index.html file and what we're going to do here is that from line 3, you can see a line number there, 3, we're going to delete everything all the way down. So if you haven't looked at HTML before, uh, I would recommend you that you find this w3schools.com slash html slash html intro ASP. Uh, this will give you a quick intro to all these tags that exist in HTML. But I'm going to build this course so you can kind of hang along and learn things on the go if you don't know these things before. But I really still recommend that you would take a look at both the HTML here and the HTML CSS here. Uh, these are kind of the basics for just knowing how to mark up web pages. But let's get into building stuff and learning things on the go. So I'm going to add Anna. We're going to add her phone number. We are going to add Anna at sorry uh, Chinese doesn't work uh, let's have Anna at fake email.com and then we're gonna add an H colon and just 30 this is just pure plain normal text to be write in any document um, then we can either click here or click control s I'm gonna take control s on my computer and you see that the file was saved uh, so let's go to this contact application and take a look. Okay, nothing has happened. Why? Well, we haven't reloaded the web page. So let's reload the web page and you see that it looks very different from before. So now I want to take a look at how does this code behind this web page actually looks like. So we're going to right click or control click on a Mac. So right click on a PC or left or control click on a Mac. Click inspect element. So here we get into code inspector. We can see, okay, so I can't see Anna anywhere. Where is Anna? Well, we see that this has been highlighted in gray behind. So let's open that one up. Bonk. And we can see that Anna is here. But why, why is there no line breaks? 
Well, we need to write line breaks in HTML to represent that there will be line breaks. So let's do that. So we know that we want something behind Anna that gives us a line break. And in HTML, we write smaller than br and slash and bigger than sign. So let's click Control S again. Either we can click Try View. I like having these ones up on tabs. So I just can easily switch between code view and this view and this is one of the nice features of HTML and then we can see that if I refresh this page again that Anna suddenly has um, a line break here and we can also see that the code has changed here on the web page that there is a BR there uh, let's close this code inspector go back and we're gonna add this to every single line uh, coders are lazy by nature and it's actually good to copy working code because it's a smaller chance that you will actually write some errors. If I wrote br back sl br slash br slash br slash I might suddenly do you know slash br and then you know it might not be what I wanted to. So I'm gonna save this again and we'll see what happens with the context application. We will do a refresh and now we we'll see every single piece of information is online. Uh, so let's get the code inspector there again and we click the control and control click or right click on a PC on a Windows machine we click inspect and let's open this one up again and now we see that all of them has BRs and we didn't need one and under the last one because there's nothing under it uh, but let's say we wanted to create we want to make this one bold so let's let's make that bold where are we looking? Okay, here's the code. So uh, to do that, we need to surround this piece of information of a start tag and an end tag. And to make something bold, you write B. And now you see, okay, what happened there? You kind of added this thing behind, and that is called auto completion. So let's just delete that for now. So smaller than character, B bigger than character. Be careful about that. And if I write a smaller character and now a slash we get auto completion again. So that's a nice thing WebTopy does for you. It gives you auto completion when writing code. You don't have to write so much yourself and there's less chance of errors. So let's save this one. And we go to the context. We click refresh. And we see that the phone number now is in bold. But let's say we think that, you know, the email is pretty or the name let's say we want to we would put the name in in the red so how do we do that well we need a start tag around before Anna and an end tag so whatever is inside these two becomes whatever this tag is so in this case we're gonna add smaller than and then write font and if you see the auto completion uh, I delete that and smaller than slash and it gives me font automatically. We're going to save again. And let's try another thing. We're going to click try view. Click try view. Okay, so now we see that nothing has really happened with Anna. So let's control click again. Click inspect element. And let's see. Okay, so font. Okay, well it seems like the that there is a start tag and there's an end tag around Anna, but nothing has happened. And that is, of course, because we don't have any color for it yet. It just has says, okay, there's a font around it. So now we have to click back instead. And I think it's easier to just keep one tab open with the, with the URL to my page and then one to code with. So let's go to the font. We're going to add a style around it. Style, we write, equals, double quote, double quote. Um, and not single quotes. Single quotes look like this. This is not what we want. So we're going to write color because we want to change the color. Colon, red, and semicolon. So let me take that again. You need a space between this font and the style. Then you need to write style equals double quotes, no single quotes, color, colon, red, semicolon, double quote and then we should be done so let's say that again control s or you click here both works and now we're gonna click contacts here 
and Anna is now red. And what do we always do when we have a small change? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we can come back here, if we screw things up, if we can't get things working? Of course it is. So at this point, we go to our versioning up here and we say added uh, Anna to our contacts and we save. And now you can see that the revisions here is that for reasons that has to do with programming, it starts with zero, not one, and this is very common in programming. And then our my second revision became Anna or added Anna to our context. And that would if I want to jump back now to start start a project, you just click zero, and then I could say revert back to this version. But we won't do that. So see you in the next video. And click site or click contacts. Doesn't matter. We let's go back in here. So we're back where we started. Okay, we're back here and now let's say we run into some trouble and so we have to learn how to get unstuck from, you know, we, we built some code and you, you feel really horrible, like you tried so much, you looked through the internet and, you know, you just can't find any solution to your problem. So how do you share some code you have written with somebody else if you want them to be able to uh, look at your app and you know, solve the problem for you or give you some feedback on what you have done. Well, uh, I'm here at, you know, if you click the site, if you just log in, then you're going to get here. And here we have the context application we built before. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to click manage and we're going to pack all. And that will pack the whole application, including databases and whatever code you have, into a file which you can share. And if you saw there, you kind of jumped down and yeah, downloaded a whole package with everything. So that download into my uh, let's close things here so you can see better. Uh, this web to pi dot app dot contacts dot wp file uh, and this file includes everything inside this app we created, including databases which we're gonna take a look at later. Uh, so this one, this file you could email to people or you could upload into a forum if it's not sensitive data. Remember that it saves the data too, so if you have sensitive data you might not be able to do this. Uh, and let's say I got this file from you, so then I'm going to go and say, okay, under this upload and install package application, or it's student x app, I can call this application whatever I want, or student contact app. So you sent me some file and I just want to keep clear that you sent this file to me. Then I would select the package and whatever file here is okay because it's the same file. I just tried it up before. Uh, and then I'll click install. So what happens now is that it uploads from my computer to Python Anywhere. And now we see that we added a new app. And if we click this app here. And see what happens. We can see that this, <laughs> the title has changed here now from contact to student contact app is because it's, it shows the name of the app here. But you can see that the things that we created before, the Anna in red, and then the phone number here is here. So if you want to share code with somebody, uh, this is a great way. And if you want to get rid of this later, you just click uninstall, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to uninstall it on on my here, and now we're back where we were before. So this is a great way if you want to share some problematic code with somebody else and you want an easy way to do that or if you want to take local code from your computer if you have is if you have developed code on your local computer and you want to move it online it's a great first way to do this on in this video we're going to learn about databases and we're going to create our first database so this will be really exciting um, what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look at the context application first to understand why are we at all creating databases? Why are we using them? So I'm going to control click and open this one in a new tab. Uh, and I can see this app we created before. And the problem here is that if I if I need to manually add these in code, you know, then I would have to write this red thing for every single person and I have to write the BR for every person. That would be insanely time consuming and very prone to errors. Instead, what we can do is that we can create the database where we save 
all this information about different people or employees of this company and that's what we're going to do now so let's open the edit here of contacts and uh, let's do like this we're going to click create under models here so this is going to be our where we write how our database should mo like the model for um, the tables that we want to create in a database so we're going to write db contacts uh, dot py the important part here is that well it has to come after d because if you write contacts only here uh, you could actually do like f contacts because s f is after d but uh, i usually write like db underscore contacts the character has to come after d <laughs> so you could write font hats if you want the the name here doesn't really matter so let's create this one so we see that this file came under db very important otherwise you're going to get an error uh, and let's take a look here first in the db.py file and you're going to get like mega scared here if you if you haven't seen code before you're like oh i don't understand this but really what the only thing i want to show here is if you're a little bit experienced i just want to show you one thing here we have something called a db variable it is holding a connection to a database engine or and uh, in this case, we're using SQLite. Uh, this is going to be changed later to uh, some other database because this is not really something you would use for production. Anyways, let's go back, click the edit, and get started with creating our contacts database. So we click edit on DB contacts. And now let's start defining our database. So hang along here. Just write db dot define table. So we're telling the database to define a table, which name is going to be employees. Write a comma. You can use single quotes or double quotes here. The only rule is that you really have to be you have to do the same all over. So if you use single quotes here, you're going to have to use single quotes from from here and down. Then we're going to add a field. And we're going to call it name. And uh, that's pretty much it for now. Uh, and I want to just highlight some things. You have to close, like open here and close here. You have to put a comma after each line, except the last one. And for this field, you have to write in capital letters, exactly like it says here. And the single quotes. So let's save this. Uh, the way we would force the database to create this table I just defined is to run it and we're going to use something called an app, ad, app admin uh, which exists under controllers by default and if we click the index here it now is going to create that table so if you don't click here it's not going to be created and that can be really frustrating if you don't know that this is how you have to do it but anyways, now it's created and we can see that there is a database and the database is holding db.employees, which is the name of the table we created. Let's click new record and then we say Anna. And OK, we get a new record created. That's awesome. And let's create Johan. Bam. OK, but where are these two people? Are they in our context application if we refresh them? Nope. Uh, if I click this, we can see that there's a database with the name of DB and a table with employees. And this is the place we have saved or this is where we can find our employees right now. So here we can see that there are two, two employees. And the cool thing about this is that now we don't have to go into code and check again we can just click number one here and call her Anna's and submit and <laughs> you can see that Anna has become Anna's uh, but let's say we're not happy we, we want all that other information too um, so let's go back again uh, to design so click design we go back into db context of py 
And this is something I really like. If you use other frameworks like uh, like Django, uh, this can be really messy to do. But let's change this model. So we're going to add three fields. One, two, three. Because we had those before, am I right? It was four fields in our context application. So what were we doing? The phone was phone. Then we had email. And then we had H. So for each employee, we have a name, a phone, an email, and an age. Uh, but let's say we don't want uh, them to be able to write text, textual age, but they can only accept the number age. And it has to be an integer, whole number, not 30.5. Well, what we can do is that we can give this a parameter, and we can write that this is going to be an integer. Uh, cool. Let's do something here. Uh, just mess it up. Like, so let's not just be perfect all the time. Let's do something wrong. You see, I took the call my way here now, and there should be one. Let's try to save it again. So I'm saving. Bam. Now we can see that we failed to compile the file because there was a syntax error at line seven at character twenty. Invalid syntax in this file at line 7. Okay, well, let's take a look at there. So, line 7, and in this file, okay, we're in that file. You can see that this is the same file. We have a problem. And what is this syntax error? Well, you can have different types of error when you do when you program. In this case, it's, uh, well, you just wrote something wrong. And if we just add the comma here, voila, and it works. So let's take a look at that, how that looks. So we're going to go into the back here in the edit again. And we're going to go to the app admin and we're going to click the index here. Bam. We're going to go to the DB employees and we're going to show them. And then we can see that these fields has been created now. It looks a little bit like Excel, if you imagine, and you got this employees.id. And where the heck did that come from? Well, uh, it turns out that for databases to be able to uh, know different employees or different rows in a database, you need some way of identifying each row in um, in your Excel sheet or database in this case. So this ID field is created automatically for you. Let's change Anna. So we can click here, but we definitely can click the number one here. And let's add her phone number. A little bit fake data. Anna at Anna.com and let's change her. She has become one year older. Uh, now you can see there's not none 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 in here anymore over at Anna, but let's change Johan also. So we're gonna add a fake here. We're gonna write Johan at fake email.com and 42. Save. And we can see that the database has updated those fields and everything is all right now. So let's just take a look at what we've done before we move on. Um, we've created a new file called DB Contacts. This is a model. We're trying to first we have to model how the data is going to look like. It has to be uh, syntactically after D, so EF or DB underscore C because that comes after DB. Uh, as a file name, uh, we can edit here and take a look quickly what we've done. We have set told the database to define a table with the name of employees, and we told them to create fields, several ones, uh, just by standard. These are textual fields, so a name, a phone, an email. Then we added an age, but we didn't think that textual data there would be okay. Uh, so we forced it to create a whole number or use whole numbers only. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much for now. What did we forget in the last video? Well, of course we forgot to version control our, uh, our changes. So let's add here, we click the versioning and added model for employee data. Uh, so let's commit that one.
So now we can see that we started a project, then we added Anna to our contacts, and then we added a model. We described the data that we want to keep in a database. And then we created that database by going to that app. What's it called again? I forget. I always forget. App admin. So we clicked here, and when it clicked here, the database actually created what we had defined in this file. Anyways, so let's look at these controllers and what they are. Uh, let's look at this default.py file. And this might look a little bit scary if you're new to programming, but I can just tell you there's nothing to be scared of here. The, this is just comments. Just somebody wrote here that you know how you can use this file. And then we have something called def index, and this is also just comments. Uh, uh, and what we're going to do is that we're just going to do everything until here. Um, and this is actually Python programming. This is a Python code we're actually looking at. And what I want you to do is delete everything until here and then click enter. And if we're going to look here, Python is a little bit specific as a coding language because it requires you to have four spaces or two spaces. And here, by default, we're using four spaces in web to pi So stick to that um, we're going to play with errors and see how we can fix them and so on but let's just move on so we're going to create something called a variable and what the heck is a variable well think that it's like a container that can hold values so let's just play along and you know get things working and understand by doing things so i'm just going to give it a name a stupid name um mika variable and then i'm going to write equals and then a number uh, and then we're going to write return locals uh, you don't have to understand this last thing but what it does is that it takes this variable and renders it with the file that we used before so let's go to the view and default index.html so now you can see it Partly I have the controller default file. That one is this one we've been working on here. And then we have a view. Uh, if we want to write that out, what we just had, we do this crocodile open and close, two of them each, equals an Amica variable. We're going to save this one. And now let's try to understand what the heck is going on here. Uh, let's just refresh this contacts. So we click refresh here. And ooh, we get a mega error. So what have I done wrong? Mika variable is not defined. Okay. So we can see that here. This is the name error it tells me. Okay, so let's go back there. I like having errors because then I can teach you what the what what they're wrong I have probably not saved this one that's my good guess so we save it uh, and let's do this again and voila and you can see that this number I added to that py file has been added here so wh what's going on here well what happens with web to pi is like this when you add for slash contacts default slash index it's going to go to the context application then it's going to go to the default.py file or whatever name.py file in the um, what do we call them again um, in the controller. So we app the controller and then the function. And you don't need to know about functions anymore, it's except that a function is something that in Python you write def and then index or def or something. But this is the function name. So one, one, once more, the app name, the controller file name, in this case, default.py, and then the index function, which is this one. And everything that comes under is logical code in Python. And then it takes, then I created this variable, which holds this value. And then I told it to, re to render this with this variable, that is whatever is in this function. And how does it know which file it should use to create this web page? Well, it will use the default 
index. And remember, if we go to, so you see, they're kind of mapped together here. It's called default slash index. So this is the file name up here, and this is the function name. So it knows that it's, if we if we look here, you can also open it here, but it knows that there are two functions in this file. One is index and one is the user. We don't need to care about that right now. But if we click the index, it knows that this is default slash index is its HTML file it will use to render whatever data that was passed to it, to the render function. A little bit messy there, but yeah, it's uh, it's gonna get really clear during the course how how this works. Uh, and then we printed it out. Uh, so I passed this Mika variab variable with a value over to this template, and then I used these two crocodiles and an equal sign, and then a variable name. And we can even change this one just to show that the variable name doesn't matter at all. We can write hello, we Sam. And if we save here and we try to run now, we're going to get an error. Why? I like having errors because this says Mika variable is not defined. And where is it not defined? Well, it's not defined. And then it gives you something called a traceback. And you can say that on line 95 on views slash default slash index.html. Okay, there's some issue there. So let's go there. Uh, and we know that it's a view slash default slash index.html which of course is the file that we were changing here and it says Mika variable but now this variable doesn't exist because we renamed it to hello Sam so we're gonna copy that one we're gonna put it into the index file and we're gonna save uh, and uh, then we're gonna give it a break here also br back slash so we'll get it on the next one and so it's saving, saving, saving. It's a little bit slow here. I don't know why. Ooh, and here we got the conflict. Sometimes when you do this, you're gonna get this uh, this weird thing resolve conflict file. The only thing you need to do is to click the new and merge. That's your latest. I might have this open in a different window. Uh, and so okay, so I added this and I changed the name here to match exactly my controller. Come on, open it up. Yeah, but there we go. So index hello is Sam is the variable name. And then I print it out here by saying, okay, crocodile, crocodile equals and then the variable name. So let's save again. Three, two, one. And then we try the view. And we can see that we have added it here. So to repeat here, it will go to the context application we created. It will go to the default controller to the index function which we have let's open our controller index function so default file index function it's going to do stuff here which are logical or we call this this, this is the programming code and then we're going to return this variable and we're going to render it by using a view with the same name as the controller, which is default to pi slash index dot HTML. And it knows this. Um, and that's for now. So let's move on to the next video. Okay, so in our last version, we created this variable which we passed from our controller to the index file. Uh, let's do our version controlling. Added variable holding uh, number. Can add a commit for that so we can see that we have moved on. Um, but this is not really what we want to do. We want to get all these. Uh, I'm going to control click and open a new tab. We want to get all these. Um, employees out of our database that we had before these two so let's close this one and we're going to open the default.py file again here so we click edit uh, and i just want to give you uh, 
an error first. So I promised you to give you some errors and see how to fix them. So now we have three spaces here instead. What happens if you if you have different spaces here? Well, click save and we get failed to compile because indentation error at line 14 at character 3. And we can see the file name, default py at line 14. So let's see 14 default py. We're looking at default py. Somewhere here, you can see line 14, and well, here we see. It. So there's an indentation error, remember? We save, and everything is okay again. You can click there to get it away. Now, we don't want this hello, Sam. We want to get all the employees out of our database. So let's open our models and the DB contacts. So we know that the variable, which is called DB is holding a table called employees with all this information. So let's get it out on our web page. We are going to delete Hello is Sam. Uh, we're going to still have four spaces here. Sometimes I just delete everything and click here because it helps you to automatically indent. And we're going to all, sorry, all employees equals. And then we're going to ask the database for db dot employees which are bigger sorry employees dot id which is bigger than zero and then dot select so what am i doing here well i'm creating a, a variable kind of think of it as a container i could call this my employees employees all the employees doesn't matter and then I said that whatever is on the right side of this equal sign is going to be saved here so whatever result this gives is going to be saved in this variable name and I asked the DB to find DB dot employees the table and employees with the ID number which is the value which is bigger than zero and then I told it to go and find those so we know to have a database with the table name employees and the ID field is hidden because that's created automatically for us, but we know that exists from before. And how do we get that out on our cool web page? Well, first we should save this and then we have to open the view for this and it, it's really easy here because you can see edit the views for index. Well, and then we get that automatically up here. So again, edit views index. Instead of hello is Sam, we're now going to write all employees. Uh, let's save that and check what happens. So what happens here is that I do a search, I send it onto variable, I try to render this function with this variable being sent to this HTML file, you could say, and then I try to print it all out. So I crocodile crocodile equals all employees. This is the same name as I had here and I could write my employees and then have the same thing here uh, but let's save it and run it so see that both this one is saved and that the view is saved the HTML file so let's try this view now Woohoo! and here we see that we are suddenly printed this out but this is not really really good looking I want it yeah, I don't want it to look like this I want it to look like this uh, but still, this is pretty cool. If I would go into the um, to the database and add another one, it will still work. And I think we got pretty far by now. Um, so let's open that view again. When we when we click this try view, it kind of closes all these tabs. So let's open the uh, the index file, and you can see there has created an extra HTML file that sometimes happens when web to pi saves it it just creates error um but we want to print out so it looks exactly okay let's refresh here that was an old error we had we want it to look like this for every person and uh, the reason it looks like this automatically is that web to pi when it when it gets a table to be get printed out or something called a dictionary in this case it automatically tries to format it in a nice way uh, so it, it, it does this automatically for you, like, behind the scenes. So it's not like 
this is formatted in this way it just when it when it gets uh, a table object from the database it's going to print it out like this instead but it's a nice easy way to get a quick feedback if you did something right uh, but now let's print them all out and make them look like this instead so let's write like this for employee let's or me the employee or person in all employees colon pop, pop, pop. so here we have crocodiles so opening crocodiles and ending crocodiles then we have to go all the way down and then we're gonna say end uh, and then we're gonna mark everything here and you're gonna click the tab so you kind of get an indent you don't need to indent it but it, it's much easier to read to understand that for every employee in this list of employees I created that we got from the database here all employees uh, we're gonna now print out every value in our database so we're gonna replace Anna crocodile crocodile and then do equals an employee dot what the heck was that name I think so let's look let's open up the model and see what the name was DB contacts so employees name and remember here employees here uh, this is not a great way to stand up because this should actually be employee uh, but anyways um, what am I talking about I'm talking about the employee one employee I'm looking at all these employees I'm picking them from a list putting one by one into this employee variable running all the code and then coming back again picking up the next employee putting it into the employee variable and then printing one by one out so let's just do it and equals employee dot what was here it was phone I think so let's look here phone yeah and then we're gonna go to the email here uh, and then employee dot email and then we still want that age so it's just the value that gets printed out here so equals employee dot age let's save this one and just to show that it really doesn't matter if I have a, because this is an HTML file not the Python file um, here it doesn't matter with the indenting that you know I'm gonna create a weird indenting here and then I'm gonna save and let's reload the context application and please nope okay great another error we love errors N tag is unmatched. Please check if you have a starting block tag. I think it should be pass there. Yeah, pass. So you shouldn't say N there. You should say pass. But it's great. It gives us opportunities to see what it should be there. And there we can see that Anas is printed out and Johan is printed out, but maybe we want a little bit of space in between every single one. So we're gonna give an extra BR here copy and then paste that in we can have two so we get two line breaks save again reload the app and voila if we would go in now to uh, to the database we would find that we can change these in a database and then it would be printed out so a quick summary um, first we went into the controller we created a variable with all employees I could have just called them employees or whatever and then I made a search in the database I saved that search in the result of that search in all employees I went to my uh, the corresponding default slash index.html uh, and then I said for every employee in all employees I took the employee the first employee out of that list and the name and I printed out on this HTML document and then I did that same for phone the employees email and for the age and then I did this like over and over again for every single employee in the take in the database so uh, let's see that everything works reload and yeah it's still out there 
and we can see also that if we add if we click the edit if we add an employee we can go here and then we create a new record and we're just going to say Mika I'm not going to have it obviously phone number and Mika at fake email.com and I am 35 currently submit it a new record was created we can reload our app and Mika comes up here isn't this just awesome <laughs> anyways so let's do what we always should do which I have forgotten a couple of times now we should click back on the design to get into this and click versioning and added printing out uh, employees out of the, the database we commit it and now we can see our whole history of how our project has been running back and forward and we're going to use that later in a really cool way anyways thanks for now and see you in the next video okay let's have a lot of fun remember that I taught you before how to package applications well I have a student following this course which is a total beginner uh, well he played the ground a little bit with HTML and something called CSS and a little bit something called JavaScript but really this guy is a beginner and I think this will be really fun to integrate code and problems US students get into this course so what he did was that he packed this one and he sent it an email to me and I now have it on my computer so let's take a look at his problem so I'm gonna student contact app I'm gonna select his file which he sent to me so I have this file he sent to me and I downloaded it and we're gonna install it on our instance you can I'm gonna put it up for you too if you want to mess around with it and um, so let's take a look at this app so I'm gonna control click or right click on a PC open it up we can close all these things we don't want anything else there so okay he the title of the app is coming up here and the one variable I guess uh, let's manage and check it out click edit okay so we see that dp1.pyk created the uh, the definition the model of the table let's go and check in the app admin if it's working and yeah there's something called DB employees let's see if there are any employees yeah they're there uh, let's go back click design um, why aren't they getting printed out well let's go from the back let's go from the view and backwards to see what's happening here so we go to default index.html and we see that he has written okay there's a Mika variable here that that one is probably getting printed out that one is this one but why aren't those all those employees getting printed out well let's first see if there's anything in this variable all employees so always take small mini steps when programming and get some feedback that you're actually doing things right so all employees let's just print it out and see if anything goes so I saved it there um, we're gonna refresh this one nothing happening okay so there's probably nothing in this variable at all we open the controller and let's go here okay so this looks good make a variable there's an all employees variable and it goes to DB then it makes a search for DB dot employees dot ID which is smaller than zero but hey wait, all right let me just look here aren't IDs bigger than zero normally so let's open the index in the app admin we go to the DB employees and we can see that employees have to be bigger than zero they can't be smaller than zero so we have to fix this can't be smaller than zero it has to be a bigger than zero and then select uh, also remember I don't have three it has to be four here seems to be five spaces this is this could mess up the code really bad uh, let's delete the Mika variable we don't need that and let's take it away here also otherwise we're gonna get a mega error so save here and save here save here control s or click this one but see that both will change so let's see what happens now boom ba dum woohoo look here we get both we get them here and we get them here um 
So we don't need this one anymore because we know it's printing out. Uh, I think it's really solved everything, uh, but I, I also see that there is some misunderstanding here. When I make a search in a database for the table for all the employees, I put it in a variable called all employees, but we could call it employees if we wanted to. So let's save that one. Now, let's change here. So employees is now holding all the results from this search. And we're going to pick one employee in all these employees. And we're going to go through all of them one by one by one and print them out. So it's not employees here. It's one employee. It's one out of this list of people. So sorry, list of employees. So I think this looks better now for because it says for every employee in employees, go one by one like this all over, you know, pick one out, put it in here, print it all out, and then go to the next one if there is one and print it out. So save and let's see how this looks now. Oh, it looks much better, but there's no space. So let's add that extra space we had in there. BR and save. So now it should give a little bit of space in between them also. Yeah, this, this starts looking much better than before. Okay, so let's delete that file we just created. And uh, we're going to click uninstall. We don't need that one anymore. So if you did the same thing as me in the last video where you followed along, then just take that one away. Uh, now let's take a look at this contacts application. Let's close the student contact app and let's click that one. So what are we missing here? Uh, well, let's say that we wanted to programmatically calculate like the total age of all these people. What would we do then? Well, let's go back and uh, let's open this one in a f another window. So control click on a Mac and right click on a PC. I think this will be one of the last times <laughs> I tell you how to do that. Um, and we're going to open up the view here. So take index.html and click edit. So how do we calculate the total age of all these people? Well, first we're going to need a container where we can like add one by one by one all the ages. And as I said before, like these containers where we can keep values are called variables. So let's create the variable here. This time we're not going to write equals because we don't want to print it out yet. We just want an empty container where we can kind of add and add things together. So let's say total age equals zero. So now we have a variable called total age. Uh, and whatever is in these uh, crocodile brackets is actually pure Python code. It's good to know. And now we have this employee.age here, and we want to add this. So let's take let's take two crocodiles again, and write total age equals total age plus not age employee.age. So does that look great? Uh, yeah. So let's see what happens here. So I have a total age which is zero from beginning. You go into this for loop that is kind of over and over again printing out things. Again here, here's no equal sign. I'm just saying total age equals total age plus employee of age. So the first time when it goes to the first employee, it will okay say for okay. So it goes from up to down, and then it says okay total age is zero. Then it gets the first employee from all employees, puts it into employee, runs all the way and prints things out. But then it gets here and it says, okay, so total age is equals to zero plus 33, I think it was, no, 31. Then it's finished and then it goes down and then it says, okay, so let's see if there's any more employees. And then, it, oh, there's a second employee and that person has 42 years so it goes puts all this thing in a new employee or in this variable employee 
it goes all the way down and total h is now 31 equals 31 plus 42 and then it goes all the way down and then okay is there any more yep there is one more so it puts that last person which is Mika and it puts that data into that variable and then it goes all the way down and I don't remember how much we were up to but it should be like 70 something so it's total age equals 72 plus 35 and I already lost count so we need a place also after this for loop to kind of print out how much the total is so let's write it out so total is then we want to print out the value of the total h variable and then we want to write years so let's save that and let's take a look what happens let's refresh total is 108 years so this is a for loop and these are variables this variable here is holding a lot of employees but it takes one by one and puts it in, into employee and then it runs until it's totally empty and while it does that total age is incremented every single time it kind of loops over every single employee and finally when we get here after it's finished and there's no more employees in this list of people it's going to put it down here the total age out here uh, but what if we wanted to say the average here so let's copy this and how do you calculate an average well you take the amount of how many people or how many years and you divide it by all the employees am I right so let's do that so the average is total age divided by and how do we how can we count how many things we have in this variable called all employees well there is a function in Python called len which is a short for length uh, so len is for length write that down on a paper uh, I highly recommend you to do that anyways write things down um, it keeps it clear in the head and you can go back and look at it and then we have all employees so what's gonna happen here well it's gonna go in here the Python interpreter and it's gonna look here and it's gonna find this len function so then it's gonna find how many things are in this variables then I'm gonna count those okay there's three so it's gonna take total age which was 108 and divide by three and let's save that one so let's refresh again so total is 108 years and the average is 36 years and yeah that's it so let's go with versioning as we should added total years and average years and we commit okay so once again we have a new file with a student problem so let's go and check it out and see how we can solve this issue so they have sent me a package version of this contact file so let's call it student contact app again and this time we have a second file let's see that we're actually picking the right one yeah that would, that's the right one in my case and we click install so this student had problems figuring out how to do this average thing so let's take a look here how it looks like well let's first let's just open this and see what what has been going on so they print out everything and the issue here is age 12 age 120 age 121 and age 100 and the average should definitely not become five years am I right so let's take a look at this app and see what's going on um, let's go down to the index.html file 
in the view section. So, okay. What happens is that the Python interpreter is going to start from the top of the of the page and it's going to walk down. So here we can see something that has happened. The total age has been defined in the beginning within the for loop, which means that when every single time the for loop runs, it is actually set to zero. So this one should, of course, be outside of the for loop. Let's save. and make it a little bit better looking. So let's refresh this and see if that solves the issue. Uh, no, that doesn't save, solve the issue. So what's going on? Okay, so let's see how total age is added or incremented every single time. How's that happening? There's something wrong here also. Uh, what happens is like this here, total age is zero, then it goes into the form loop, picks one employee and puts it into the variable person, and then it prints everything out, that looks okay, that looks okay, but then it comes here, and what happens here is that every single time it comes here, it takes that total age and puts it to the value. So it just takes the last value and then every time it kind of gets to the last value. So when it comes down here, let's just make it super clear. Total age, sorry, total age. So let's just print that out, what's actually in there. So let's refresh here. We see that this 22, so it just, every single time it loops over each person, it just takes the total value and uh, and replaces it with 12 and then with 120 and then 121 and then 22 so when it gets here and starts dividing it get, becomes 22 divided by 4 1 2 3 4 so that's wrong right so let's fix that how do we do that well the reason is it should be total age plus person dot age so it always takes everything it had before and adds the last person's age to that and then adds it to this variable so this becomes what it was plus the last person's age so if we save now again and see what has happened here when we print that out so let's have to see what happens here so now we get 275 and we get if we divide that by 4 we get 68 years so yeah let's do calculator and I think we actually have something wrong here anyways uh, 275 divided by 4 how much is that 275 divided by 4 See, it should be a decimal. Well, here is the thing. Uh, we're doing integer division, and then it becomes lower. So we should have 68, but we're we're dividing integers, which, if you remember your your math class, if you divide integers, if you divide like three with two, you actually get one. But when you have three divided by two here, you get 1.5. So that's why this one becomes lower. Uh, how do we fix that? Well, we could cast it, but I don't think we're going to fix that now. Uh, but at least we're getting pretty close to what we want. Um, maybe we could cast it. Uh, and if we want to divide an integer, and we want it to be like 0.5 or 0.75 in this case, we have to at least cast one of these two values to um, a float. So we're gonna take a f write float. I'm gonna save and let's see if we can get this right now. Yeah, and now we see.
So what the heck happened here? Okay, what is a float? Well, a float is a decimal value. So I took an integer value, which is a whole number, and I, I remade it into a decimal number. And when you divide a decimal number with four, you get a decimal number coming out of the calculation too. So that's how it worked out. We could also have done like this, that we said, okay, we don't want this to do a lot of complex stuff here. So let's just do uh, total age equals float. Remember, we want to remake that integer to a decimal from a whole number to a decimal number. So total age. And I think this would look a little bit better, actually. So then we can print that out again. And we do total age. Click save. And let's run this so we can see what happens. Should be the same, though. Yeah, so but now it's 275.0 divided by 4. And that becomes... 68.75 years, which is correct. So now we have solved everything in this student's problems, and we have also found a logical bug here. You know, to divide an integer with four and it becomes uneven, it will automatically uh, go to the lower values. We saw it became 67. Well, it should be 68. So 68.75, sorry. Yep, yeah, so that was it. See you in the next video. Okay, in the next video we're going to play around in something which is called the Python interpreter. And if you're on a Mac, I just want to show you how you can open it up on your Mac. Uh, because the next video is actually going to be on a Windows machine. So, how do I do it? Well, I click Command, which is just on the left side of the space button. Or, and then you click Space. So, hold down Command and click Space. And then you write terminal, then you click enter, and uh, that's going to open up this one. And uh, to open a Python interpreter on the Mac, you write Python, and that's it. Uh, you should see Python 2.76. If you don't, uh, maybe you should write sorry Python, and then you can. Let's see which ones, which versions I have here. You can write, you see here, 2.7. So that way you can be sure that you open the right version of Python up. So what I've done here is to open up the terminal in my Mac. Uh, I've written a little bit of commands before. So just write IDLE and click enter. And this Python shell should open. Now let's move on to the PC. So I'm on the PC now, and one thing which is special with Windows machines is that Python is not installed from scratch. So I want you to go to python.org slash download and download this Python 276, not the Python 3. This is an incompatible version, and install it on your computer. When you have done that, click the start, and we open Python 27 and the IDLE. So what are we going to use this for? Um, well, we're in the Python shell we can see here. And some cool things we can do here is to, that we, I usually use this when I just want to mess around with code, and I, which I don't really know how to write, for example, in this web environment. So let's write the variable here and explain what this means. Name equals, and Mika, click enter, and then we just write name and enter. So what do we see here? Well, we see a variable name, which is called name. This could have been x, uh, flappy bird equals Mika. And what happens here is that this variable points to Mika. And why is it called a variable? Well, it can vary. So I write name equals Johan, enter, and then I write name. And I can see that the value of name it points to now has now became Joan. So it's not Mika anymore. Mika is gone. And um, let's say I wanted to capitalize Joe, the, the variable, the value of name. 
So I don't know how to do this. This there's a really helpful thing here we can do, which is called dir. If you have used the DOS before, you know that you will get everything that in a folder with this. But let's look at the dir of name instead. And ooh, we get this huge list here. So we see that we get something called title here, and we can do upper. So let's just try this name dot, and then upper, and like this. And we get a huge John. The value of Johan does, hasn't changed. It's still the same. It just calls this function on this. It kind of takes what's in here and pushes it through upper and publishes it out, which becomes big. So and then we have the title. We wanted to capitalize it. We can just do name.title. And this is pretty common. Let's say you have somebody who wants to they write their name in uh, in this form we had before and you want every name of the, of uh, which is in our database and you want them with a title then you would actually do like this or as we wrote before it, you would add employee dot name dot title then then it would actually print out the database value of the name as a title so let's move on so we're back here in Windows and uh, let's just close this and start over again. So programs, Python, IDLE, we don't have to do it, but it's cleaner. And uh, I want to teach you a concept called lists. What we did before was something called name equals um, Mika. And this is called a string. A yeah, string is a, is a list of characters, M, I, K, and A, M, right? Uh, but let's say I have a lot of people and I want to be able to kind of print each name out. So let's create a list of people and then I write equals and then I do these two brackets here. And let's put three strings in here, the Mika, the Johan and the Anna. So we click enter and we can check that everything is okay so we um, copy we paste and we click enter and we can see that this variable name points at a list of three people think of it as like a shopping list and let me just show you one thing here which is a little bit special um, wait two seconds here so the first item in a list what is that is it one two three Nope. The way programmers think is by convention that this is zero, and this is one, and this is two. And it's just something you'll have to remember. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if I want to get Mika out of this list, how do I how do I ask for that? Well, let's paste and have a list of people. Uh, and we put these two brackets, same brackets as there, and I write a zero, and I click enter. And then it prints out the first value of my list. So what if I want to have Anna out? Well, we can just paste the variable name again, and we can write two. Remember? Zero, one, two. And it prints out Anna. So what if I want to know the how many people there is in my list of people? Well, then there is something we have used, which is called len, and then list of people. Sorry, now let's delete here, len, and now we can print. Not good at writing this morning. So um, let's go to the end. Enter and we can see that there's three. And what is this length? Well, it stands for length. Um, so it takes counts every single item in this list. And I could actually change this list. Um, so, for example, let's say I wanted to add a person to this list. So I did dot, and then I can see that what the Python interpreter here is doing is that it's helping me to show what, what I can do on this. I want to append a person, all right? I want to add one person. So I click append, sorry, app, 
append. Let's just do that again. Dot a uh, doesn't work. Dot a bit slow sometimes. Here we go. And click enter. Uh, copy and we just paste it in and we write append and then we add uh, Julia to that list. And if we print our variable out, delete the dot there, we can see that at the end of this list, Julia has now been added. And if I do len on that one, and we do paste, we can see that there's now four people. And um, yeah, let's finish with that. So I have closed the interpreter and let's open it again, Python, IDLE. And uh, now let's create another list of people, uh, a list. You don't have to write list of people, it's just, then we, if I write list, everybody knows that this list is a list. So people. And then we're gonna do the same as before. We're gonna add Mika. And then we're gonna write Johan and Yulia. Click enter. We can check that everything looks like it should inside. And we do print, click paste, and then we click enter to print it out. We see Mika, Johan, and Yulia is in this list. And let's say we wanted to kind of loop over every single value. So let's do like this. We, the most common way is to use for loop. And a for loop looks like this. For some variable in the list or the underscore list. In this case, we have a list called a list of people. It could just be called people. But if I write list of people, everybody knows it's a list of people. It's not just a string, for example. So a list of people. And what is a good variable name for people? Well, person, program, right? So this is the singular of people. Uh, and then we write colon. And then we're just going to print. Uh, I could just write person here, but I think it's more clear if we write print here. So we're going to print person. We click enter and enter. So let's just look here. What, what, what the heck is happening here? Well, it's going to go to the, a list of people, which is all these values. It's going to ask for first first thing in your list, which is Mika. Then Mika, person variable, is going to point to Mika. And then it's going to go down here, and it's going to print person. It's going to go down, nothing more to do. Whoops, let's go see if there's another person in the list, or another thing in our list. So it goes there, and yes, there is a Johan. And person points to Johan goes down to the next list, prints that person, and we get Johan out, goes up again, finds Julia, points person to Julia, goes down, prints person, so then it prints out Julia, goes up again and finds no more things in our list, and it ends. So this is how these four loops work. Uh, let's try another thing. Uh, let's say we just need to know how many characters there is in every single word in every single name? So we click enter, and then we do print, and len we used before, which is length. Uh, here, I think we can also if we um, we see here when when I start running like this, that it says the length of something, some kind of object. You don't need to. Just think of an object like any, anything, kind of a name, a number, whatever. And it will give us an integer, which in math is a whole number. So let's do it like this now. Uh, person. And how is this going to work? Well, it's going to go to the person variable. It's going to find Mika first. Then that is going to print out the, or it's going to kind of send the value of Mika into the length function. The length function will check everything and say, okay, it's going to count one, two, three, four. Okay, it gets four, I'm right, the integer number we're talking about. It's going to send that four to the print statement and it's going to come out to the screen. And then it's going to do that exactly like before. It's going to go to Mika, then it's going to go to Johan, and then it goes to Julia. So 
click enter and enter, you can see that Mika has four characters, Johan has five, and Julia has five. So when you see these four loops, just think of them like running over the list of people or in a shopping list when you go shopping you also do the same thing right you write all the things down and then you can okay where's the first one second one and third one in this case just to repeat this is the zeroth value first and second now i want to do the same thing as we did in the python interpreter but in our web page what we're going to do is that we're going to go to the default.py file and we're going to create a list. So let's click edit there and let's create a list here just on the next row where we say people equals and then an empty list. Let's do double quotes here. So let's do Mika, comma, and Johan. And so what I've done here is to create an array or a list. Lists are called arrays in, in Python and many other programming languages. And uh, this variable people now holds these two items, these two objects, which are two strings. Like a string is, you know, characters M I K A, and in this case J O H A N. So let's save this one. And then let's edit the view, which corresponds to this index function. And uh, now let's do the same thing as we did before. Uh, we're going to say, what was the name? Person, people, what was it? People, okay, great. Uh, for person in people, colon, and then to those. A good thing here is to always write pass. Sorry, you, you'll actually have to write pass here, otherwise uh, it won't understand when the for loop is over. Because here in the view, we cannot write like 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's how Python normally does. But when it comes to a view, for it, for it to understand when the for loop is over, you have to write the pass the same way we did before. So, uh, well, let's give it some indentation anyways to make it clearer. Uh, and then let's print out each person and let's click save and now let's try the view so say was it Mika and then Johan so it has printed them out uh, I just want to show you that these variable names really doesn't matter so I could change this to P so often you see this in code for p in per in people because it's shorter to write uh, let's just save this to show off that this is actually so so it still prints mika and johan out so uh, what what's going on here again so let's take it from the beginning we created a list in our index function and that variable people is then going to be passed over here into this view and it's going to be rendered here and then finally thrown back to the web browser which is going to get this HTML file where Mika and Yuan is then going to be printed out on and if we want for example breaks we can practice that again then we write BR and then it does some not so smart autocomplete there click control S to save and now we can see that there's a break there and just to practice a little bit more, uh, you control click on a Mac or right click on a PC, click expect element. This is really helpful when you develop. Uh, and okay, there's something we're going on here. So we can click there. Here we see a lot of things here. But yeah, we can see that Mika and then there's a BR and Johan down here. Great. So uh, then we have done this both in a Python interpreter and we have done this in a view. See you in the next lesson. Let's take a look here where we are. Um, we have this application, which if we open the URL to our website, we get to this welcome application. And now that's not the app that we want to show. 
because we want to show this context application if people write that in. And also, if we want to show this to friends and maybe our boss, we don't want to have this web to pi logo here, and we definitely don't want this um, development menu to be here. And uh, let's just quickly talk about what this is. If you're on a web page in your app and you have this development menu on, uh, you can just click the like this app and then view, for example, or the controller, and that will take you immediately to the right file. So if you just quickly want to get to that file and change, for example, let's change this to green, control S, and go back, try view. Then we can see now that everything has been changed to green. And so let's start fixing these things. Um, first thing we're going to do is to open up our contacts here. And we're going to open the menu.py under the models. So what is the menu.py? Well, it, it takes all these, it controls all these things up here and some other variables. We talked about variables as container of holding some information. Uh, and as we see here, it says customize your app title, subtitle, and menus. Okay, that sounds cool. Um, so let's do that. So from the py here to the web, uh, delete. So you get these two single quotes only. Be sure that it looks really exactly like this. Uh, then we write our cool company. Let's take this trademark away. Just everything except that comma over there. This one. So everything to the right there. Uh, then we also wanted to change. Uh, let's change the title also. So what are we going to do there? Uh, let's take everything here away. On the right side of the equals and just write welcome or please contact us control s we save that one we always want to make small changes and see that we're that everything is working never do big changes okay so now our cool company and then it also changed here to please contact us um, Okay, so we, we fix these two things now, but then we have this development menu and, you know, if we show this to our boss and, you know, the first thing, you know, it's, it's yellow and, you know, they would immediately start asking, what is that? That should not be on our web page. So, okay, let's take that one way. How do we do that? Turns out that in this menu.py file, you can set this variable called development menu to false instead of true. And what, what is this true false thing? So just to change this. Well, this variable is something called a Boolean variable. It won't hold text or numbers. It's either going to be true or false. It only has this on off kind of feature. So when I set that one to false with a capital F in Python, they're always like that. Uh, I mean, Boolean values. Then we can see that this now is gone. So we have one thing left to do. We're, we look pretty happy with this one now. Uh, it matches probably what our boss would like us to have, you know, a simple contact page online, like a first mini step to becoming an online company. So, okay, this, this is presentable, but still we have this issue with the URL. So if we go here, it will automatically go to the welcome app the default controller and the index function. So how do we change that? Well, let's go to the site. And now the easiest thing to do is that we know that it automatically takes us to the welcome app. So is it just to rename context to welcome? Nee, it would then it would give us this weird thing here. Uh, instead, there is another way you can do. It. You can just click manage and then pack all like we did before. Okay, now it downloaded this file to my computer. And then we can go here and write in it. We will go to my downloads folder and select that last downloaded file. Well, I've done this a couple of times now, but I was interrupted. So anyways, these are all the same, trust me. Uh, let's just open that one up. Okay, so now it's there. And then we need to install that one. So, woohoo, application init installed and MD5, so you don't need to care about that right now.
Uh, okay, so let's see what happens now. If we just take this welcome away, and we just have our link there. Voila! But now we get something really weird going on. It has changed to init here. This ain't right. So why is this happening? Let's click manage, edit. Let's go into that menu.py file. Oh, here we go. This is for some reason, I, I probably didn't save that before, before I changed. So let's just write, please contact us. And remember, this is the init application now, not the contacts application. So let's do that here. Please contact us. Well, I think we're done there for this small first step and first look into Web2Pi. And I ho really hope that you enjoyed it and that it was as fun for you as for me. Um, so remember now, I'm not going to change any more in contacts. Actually, we can probably... No, let's keep it there. Um, but yeah, what did we do here? Well, we, we downloaded the contacts app. We put it in, in it here, a new name for it. And then we uploaded that app again with a new name. And when some app is called init web2py is going to load that instead of welcome app so yeah thanks for uh, this first project and we're going to do a lot of fun projects together so i hope you enjoyed it and i'll see you in the next lesson over now